Today I woke up with so much energy and that has definitely not been the case throughout this entire pregnancy. As you can see, I'm quite pregnant. I'm nine months and I will be taking a hiatus after having my second child for obvious reasons. But I wanted to get this video in because I'm having my second child, like I mentioned, and I can still remember all the things that I did right and wrong with my first child. Whereas I find a lot of moms, like when I asked my mom for advice, she had some, but she can't remember a lot of the details and a lot of the nuances because a mother's brain has this amazing trick where it kind of erases all those experiences because a lot of them are bad and uh, to encourage you to have more children. Also, do you really want to listen to your boomer mom? I don't know. I don't know about that. Um, I'm just kidding, but yeah, they just they just don't remember the details. So I ended up talking to a lot of um, like Gen X friends with kids or or friends with, who recently had children. They were actually a lot more helpful with their advice. I will be categorizing my advice into low time preference and high time preference parenting. These are economics terms, basically meaning that. If you're low time preference, you can look into the future and make decisions that benefit you in the long run, even though it might hurt you or inconvenience you or be difficult in the short run. Whether as high time preference is when people make decisions that give them instant gratification, okay? High time preference, you want it now, you want results now, you want that rush, you want that, um, a positive feedback loop immediately. Low time preference is future oriented planning, postponing gratification, uh, reaping rewards maybe even years down the road. Number one, sleep training or sleeping through the night. I made a terrible mistake with this. Basically any baby can sleep through the night at a certain point like People will say as early as three months, but let's say between three and six months, your baby should be able to sleep through the night without feeding. Unless something is neurologically wrong with them, that is a really unknown issue if you do things correctly. I did this wrong. I actually conditioned my son to feed every hour and a half, every two hours because I was acting on a high time preference motivation and that is He's making noise, I feed him, he stops making noise, I go back to sleep. And in the long run, it really hurts you because I didn't get any REM sleep for two years. Yes, I failed so hard at this that my son was still waking up every two hours for two years. And it wasn't about feeding at that point. He wasn't hungry, I would, you know, <laughs> he would wake up for water just to suck on something. He never took a binky. Um, huge fail, please learn from my mistake and do the low time preference of sleep training your child as early as they are ready for and then mom is rested, child is rested, no problem. There are many, many, many ways to do this. Um, a lot of people don't like cry it out. There's loads of other techniques that you can achieve this result with. I have a Mormon friend with four kids and they did it with each child and each child was a little different but they all slept through the night by four or five months. So there you go, sleep train your child as soon as you can. It's a low time preference thing because it's very hard for like a week to 10 days and then you're both sleeping through the night and everyone is happy, please don't make the same mistake I did. Number two, diet. This is a sensitive topic. Let me tell you where I'm coming from when I say I don't believe in picky eaters. I have moved around a lot with my son and participated in many different churches and church groups and mom's groups and gone to playground. Like I have been exposed to a lot of kids and families in the past four years. And huh, interesting. Seems like all children, kind of like most adults, love carbs and sugar. What's a parent to do? Just give them what they want, right? Set them up for a lifetime of bad habits, bad eating, bad diet, bad health. 
because that's just the way they want to eat, right? Like you can't change a child. Uh, the preferences, they're just born with just like wanting sugar and carbs. And that's kind of true to a point. It's um, to a degree. Uh, sugar and carbs are very quick, delicious energy. Of course, that's what kids want. Okay. But as a parent, shouldn't we guide them and give them a better diet at home? Uh, it just, let me give you an example. At one of my churches that I went to, there was a chili cook-off. 20 chilies were made, some of them from uh, hunted game, like fresh, delicious meat, amazing. And not all of them were spicy, a lot of them were very kid-friendly chilies. My son was the only child out of 30, 40 kids who had a bowl of chili because the parents for some reason brought the children hot dogs and like hot dog buns and cornbread and that is literally all the other children ate are all of those children are 40 other kids just they're just picky eaters they'll just they'll only eat hot dogs buns and cornbread and my son is so special that he's the only one who ate a bowl of chili no it, it starts in the home and please do your kids a favor and don't do the high time preference thing of giving your kid what they want and letting them just eat junk the whole time because trust me even my kid if i give him mac and cheese every day he'll eat it happily but i don't i make sure that he gets his protein that he gets his fats that he gets a good well-rounded diet whatever you think the diet should be um it probably shouldn't be just carbs and sugar now i understand that every child does have a palate and preferences my son goes through phases with onions and you know specific meats and fish and then he gets over them and starts eating eating them again it's very rarely uh it's very rare that a child will have like a lifelong preference from the age of you, you know one it, it, that's not really a thing as far as i know um and even if your child does have pickier preferences that doesn't mean that the only thing that they can tolerate or like is carbs and sugar like that don't tell me that that's absurd that is totally absurd so do your best and do the low time preference thing and uh, maybe suffer a little bit with your kid if they're very demanding and stubborn about food but what I do maybe this is because I'm from a third world country and like options were never a thing my mom would make food and I would eat food or not eat it um, I was never forced to eat anything and this is my approach with my son he's never forced to eat anything he's never forced to clean his plate I make him some food uh, it's usually like a soup or like two things, two different things on his plate. And if he pushes it away and goes, I don't want it, I don't like it, I go, okay. And I keep eating. And guess what? My son has never gone hungry. He sits there huffing and puffing for a few minutes. Then he actually tries the food and eats all of it. Okay, so... I understand some children are very stubborn and difficult and some children go through very stubborn difficult phases but take it as a phase and don't just indulge their demands about what they want to eat and try to limit their options and try to limit the junk in your house because if it's around they're just like adults if it's around they're gonna want it if it's not around it's much easier for everyone uh, for the parents and for the kids to exist around the kitchen and not be um, tempted So yes, please take the advice. Don't set your kids up to have incredibly bad eating habits and It's definitely a low time preference thing because diet is hard to study and it's hard to draw um, Causation from what you're eating, but we do know quite objectively that sugar specifically is not good it's just not good for anyone so limited don't assume your kid is picky and start early start very early with them and don't give in just be calm don't give in and limit their options number three potty training this is a very interesting one this is a perfect example of high time preference and low time preference 
So high time preference is keeping your kid in diapers till they're like four or five because it's easy. You just keep them in the diaper, no problem, no mess, n not much cleanup. Um, it's instant results and really no effort on the parent's part. The low time preference is potty training your kid incredibly early and this is very achievable and people in third world countries and second world countries where diapers are too expensive or diapers didn't exist until very recently people potty train their kids before the age of one my cousin did it with her well, with daughters it's a little easier okay boy moms I understand it's harder but you can definitely potty train a girl before the age of one every child is different um, don't force it too early if your kid is incredibly resistant to it because I've heard uh, there are psychological effects where they like really internalize and make it an issue but generally speaking it's definitely doable and it's funny when my mom moved to Canada from Russia um, she goes to the store and she's like why do they have diapers for like four-year-olds and three-year-olds like she was flabbergasted that they even exist like what are these big diapers doing here because in, in Russia up until recently, everyone everyone was potty trained before the age of two. So it's not, you know, again, it depends on the kid, but just start early. I started putting my son on the potty or the toilet when he was six months old. Because when you're with your baby all the time, like you can feel them needing to go. And then you put them on the toilet when they're ready to go, especially for pooping. And they they get conditioned. They just associate that with, what they need to be doing right um another thing is once they hit the age of one or even a little bit before get them some underwear like get them cotton underwear and then that way when they soil themselves it's an underwear not a diaper what a diaper does is protect them from the sensation of being wet and poopy even in many cases the diapers are amazing these days and there's no, you know, causation. Like, I pooped, but doesn't matter, I'm still comfortable. There's no result from your action, right? Um, so if you give them underwear, even every time they pee especially, they'll feel wet and they'll be like, ugh. No one wants to be crawling around wet or walking around wet, right? So just, I mean, <laughs> I hope your house isn't carpeted because there's a transitional phase there but that's what I did and that works really really well um, otherwise you're gonna have a kid at four in diapers and then other problems begin uh, rashes uh, even your tract infections like your kid should not be in diapers at four years old it's just not good for anybody I think a big factor with the diaper thing is a lot of moms are working and they're not with their kid enough to anticipate uh, their bathroom needs because what moms used to do is stay at home with them and wear them all day and be with them all day and like they just know when they need to go and they put them on the potty and there's no mess and no cleanup either way and now moms work nine to five and they're in daycare and like the daycare is not going to potty train your kid most of the time unless it's a really good daycare. Uh, and today I'm actually I'm actually seeing daycares make more of an issue of it than the parents like the daycares will not take your kid at a certain point if they're still in diapers or they will uh, help train the child like they just won't allow diapers keep them in underwear and then the social pressure and also being and feeling the sensation of the wetness because of the underwear will help them get potty trained very quick so once your kid is like hitting three four like <laughs> They can be potty trained really quickly, you just have to make the effort. So yeah, that's a pr that's an ideal example of high time preference and low time preference when it comes to parenting. Number four, don't hover over your kid. Let them fall, okay? Uh, I'm gonna break this one into two parts. If your kid doesn't know that you can get hurt from falling, then the next time there's an incredible hazard, like a higher place where they can fall from, they'll fall and die. Uh, it's being really extreme, but it, what I'm seeing is if you don't let your kid get hurt a little bit, again, there's no consequence to their action, right? They won't, like, oh, I've never fallen because mommy always catches me. And then the one time you look away, they're not going to be careful because they've never had the consequence of getting hurt. And they could get really seriously injured at that point. So let them fall and don't react in a crazy way. Like, I saw a kid... 
I saw a girl fall on a playground. She was two, maybe two and a half. And she knew immediately to like cry and run to her mom because she knows she's gonna get a cartoon on her on an iPhone. And then she sat at the playground while I, other kids played and watched the iPhone like cartoons. She wasn't hurt at all. It was like so bizarre. Don't do that. That's awful. That's setting your kid up for failure, if not injury. Let them fall, react to it calmly, let them brush themselves off and uh, keep playing. Um, number five, so this is a part two to this. Don't hover over your kid. Let them have negative interactions on the playground. Let them have positive interactions with their friends. How are kids supposed to learn social norms and cooperation and how to work through disagreements and how to share and when not to share and all of these nuances of human uh, social social human behavior when the mom keeps intervening and like taking her kid out of situations that are uncomfortable they're, uncom they're uncomfortable for the mom not for the kid the kid is even if they're upset for a few minutes, they'll get over it. That is what how kids are made, uh, and they'll have that memory of what to, you know how to um, react or not react in the next time that that happens. That's how that's how kids learn. So stay away from your kid unless there's like, unless the two year olds are slamming each other's heads with objects. So you don't need to intervene. Let the kids play. I have a whole separate video on this, um, so check that out. I elaborated on I elaborate on it a lot. So to clarify, the high time preference, low time preference thing there was: child reaches for someone else's toy, mom feels uncomfortable and doesn't want child to embarrass her. Mom intervenes and makes sure that the child doesn't touch the other child's toy. You missed out on a learning and developmental experience for your child. Like maybe the other child would have shared the toy or maybe there would have been a little fight between the toddlers. Okay, they're going to learn from that. Leave them alone, for God's sakes, leave them alone. It's not about you. Let your kid develop. Number six, cleaning up. So I was on Instagram a few years back and Someone I know has two kids and she posted a picture of like a completely destroyed living room, just toys, like totally destroyed. Uh, toys everywhere, everything's a mess. And the caption was like, oh, I leave them for five minutes and this is what I, you know, this is what I have to deal with now, ha ha ha. It was like very lighthearted and it was, a, it was sweet, but I'm like, your kids are six and eight, what? <laughs> and this is up to you. If you're the kind of mom, you're like a little eat -a pole and you love doing stuff for your kids, like including cleaning up, you know, their mess constantly. All right, don't bother. Um, the negative from that is when they're adults, they'll probably make their significant other's life miserable unless they find someone who's also a pig, uh, but my advice is do the low time preference thing and don't at some at a point in your kid's age uh my son was three when i started doing this stop cleaning up after them they are capable of cleaning up after themselves he can put his plate away he cleans up his entire room i haven't cleaned his room in a year he can fold his laundry it's not perfect folding but he knows where everything goes and he tries his best and he feels really good about it it's you know you're giving them some responsibility for their things as well it's ownership of their space and their things so don't set expectations don't clean up after your kid for the rest of your life it's insane like i don't understand do you like you have better things to do like value yourself a little bit don't don't clean up after your kid every chance you get. Expect that they have to tidy up after themselves. And that is, it might be difficult at first, they might not do it, but stay consistent and eventually they will do it and it will make everyone's life easier in the long run. I promise. Number seven, this is a problem I see all the time and it's kids not being able to play on their own, let alone play with other kids without their parents being there you know, like right over them. Um, but I've kind of touched on that. But allow your child to learn to play on their own. 
it definitely helps their creativity, their imagination. They shouldn't need to bounce off of you the whole time. And again, this is age appropriate. This is around three years old as well, I would say, at least from my experience. Some kids probably play on their own earlier. Um, but let your child have, what we do, we do quiet time. Whether he's napping or not, he has quiet time in his room or in an area, and he plays on his own for half an hour or more. And he's very capable of doing that. And for me, I'm really glad that I instilled that pretty early because this pregnancy has been really, really difficult uh, in terms of my energy level. And sometimes I just need to sleep. And I need to know that my son can occupy himself and not bother me every five minutes. So he does. He goes to his room and he has toys and puzzles and whatever he needs to do, he does. And it's, it's valuable quiet time for him. It's valuable quiet time for you. Uh, it clears everyone's mind. And it's benefited, me, it's benefited me a lot. So that's some advice that I would love to pass on. Just start your kid with the, uh, at a certain age, three-ish, two and a half. Expect that your child can play on their own and occupy themselves. Otherwise, you're gonna have that kid who's like six and is your tail anywhere you go and can't do anything by themselves or occupy themselves whatsoever. And I guess this goes into number eight, screen time. Um, I actually don't care if I offend anyone with this. I think the screens are out of control on an epidemic level. I think it's lazy. I think it's damaging. Um, I think limited, limited screen time where they don't have control over what they're watching. Like I think giving a two-year-old or three-year-old access to YouTube is absolutely insane. If you think YouTube Kids is safe, you've missed the news. Like it's really not. Uh, the suggested videos are abysmally inappropriate half the time. So <sighs> quiet time, you know, referencing the previous point, Quiet time does not mean your kid is sitting watching a movie or sitting watching a screen or poking at your phone while you rest. Do not make your kid dependent on cartoons and movies and um, video games from an early age. We have this problem with so many adults. Like if you're a millennial, you have this problem. Don't lie to me, you're on your phone all the time. I have this problem. Learn from your own mistakes and don't pass them on to your kids. Um, it's not that hard. We don't have an iPad. We don't have a, a computer that's not in a public space. Like it's a private space, it's in our home, but it's in a living room or an open concept office. We're never gonna give our kid a computer in their room until they can buy their own laptop when they're much older. I just don't want my kid to go through what I did when I was younger. Um, and honestly, I mean, I could rant about this forever. Like I did a poll on Twitter about pornography and I had people tell me that they were exposed as early as three, four, five. And that was back then. Today it's even more accessible and I'm not a Luddite. My son does get some screen time. The opposite extreme is also bad because then they'll be drawn to the screen anytime it's around because they never get to have it. But uh, we generally do um, we do a video game that we play all together, the three of us, it's a strategy game and that's fun and he, it's strategic and it's interactive between the three of us. And he does that maybe twice a week and it lasts half an hour. And then we do a family movie night, so that's two hours. And then I'll save a half an hour to an hour of screen time uh, one more time during the week for when I am just in the worst mood ever or he's not cooperating, or he is failing at playing on his own and I really need to do something. That's actually quite rare, um, but it does happen. I'm sure all the moms know that it, it's inevitable that these things will happen. Or someone pops in and I need to speak to them and he's just biting for my attention. I will put something on for him at that point. And that's the beauty of it. If your child isn't overexposed to screens, he will really, uh, he or she will really value that time that you give him and appreciate it instead of becoming emotionally dependent on the screen and the visual stimulation. I've had play dates, and the you know the dad would bring their two-year-old's iPad with them, 
and they would sit on their iPad the whole time. And my son is literally taking the kids' hands to go jump on the bed and have like play with the toys, and the the other child is like this. And we've all seen it. We've seen it in restaurants. We've seen it at friends' houses. We've seen it. It's absolutely not okay. Limit your screen time. Um, I personally wouldn't do more than half an hour a day on average for any kid under six. If you want to learn more about how uh, technology affects your brain, read. There's plenty of studies on it. There's plenty of research on it. The best book I've read is called The Shallows. It's not about children. It's about the attention span of adults once this kind of technology, um, ha since this technology has become so immersive. And if you think that a child won't be affected twice as much when an adult is affected that much, you're lying to yourself and you're being, you, I'm sorry, you're, you're, you're in denial and you're just taking the high time preference thing of sticking your kid in front of a screen and like doing the thing that you need to do. And that's okay once in a while. But as soon as you notice that your child, and this happens quick, as soon as you notice that your child is freaking out because they're not getting the screen or because the movie is over, they are having an emotional dependence on that screen and that visual stimulation, okay? That's not healthy. And I definitely, there was a time uh, when my son was very difficult and I would let him watch more than I should have. And I noticed very quickly that he started to become very attached and emotionally dependent on the things he was watching. And I had to just cut him off because that is not healthy and it's not good. So really keep an eye on it and really try to limit it. I think I'm on number nine and this is something we've been working on because the new baby's on the way. But we are trying to train my son to not wake us up in the morning. Uh, unfortunately, we're a family of night owls, but there's only a, kids cannot be that night owly. Like they all wake up generally early, um, unless you have a magical kid that wakes up at 10 a.m. That's great. I uh, please tell me if you have a kid like that. Mine's not too bad. He wakes up 7:30, between 7:30 and 8:30, but because of my really low energy with this pregnancy it's been really difficult to get up so I've been trying to encourage him to not wake me up in the morning and play in his room and it works 50% of the time we'll see what the schedule will be like when the baby's here but it's an interesting thing to try I know some people that have achieved it where they're three four year olds five year olds do not bother them in the morning especially on the weekends if they work and they they do something in the room on their own um so yeah my son's been he's funny like once in a while he'll just wake up and play and i'll leave something out for him to eat and he'll do that and then he'll like sit down and do his lesson on his own which is so cool it's really nice to see kids get to an age where they really enjoy learning difficult things so he'll do his letters and then he'll finally come to my room and by then it's like 8 30 or 9 and i'm like okay i can get out of bed so that's a very low time preference thing it takes a lot of effort um to encourage and maintain but maybe it'll pay off especially when the baby's here so maybe i'll keep you posted on that on twitter or something but yeah um probably going to be easier when he's a little older let's do one last one and I'm no authority on this, but let's do breastfeeding. This is an obvious one, high time preference, low time preference. Definitely easier to bottle feed, 100% easier. It's a high time preference thing because it's just instant results and no trouble at all. Um, and I will say I'm not super judgmental of it. Um, the IQ thing has been debunked. There was a study where the first child was breastfed in the same, same family, same socioeconomic status, same genetics. And then for this for the second child the mom couldn't breastfeed for some reason and formula fed or the opposite the first child was formula fed the second child was breastfed and there was no significant change in iq so the main reason 
and the main benefits of breastfeeding is the boost to the immune system, being protected by the mother's milk, the weight, you know, your milk adjusts to your child's needs. Um, and of course the bonding and the beautiful experience that some women have with breastfeeding their child. So if that's the case, breastfeed till as long as you want. Um, but the it, it for me, breastfeeding was definitely definitely an extreme of a low time preference struggle. I really had to look into the future and force myself to believe that this is worth it. And uh, you know, he he's never had an ear infection, so I guess it was. Uh, it's hard to this is the thing. It's hard to quantify without doing a broad study. And they've done they have done it. It does help. It does help health wise. So yeah, I had literally everything go wrong with breastfeeding with my son, uh, both emotionally and physically. I was hospitalized for mastitis. I have a thing called breastfeeding dysphoria, which is the dumbest name ever, but it basically when, a when the baby latches, the woman's hormones bottom out and then spikes. You're supposed to feel really loving and euphoric. Mine don't spike, mine just bottom out. So I literally get clinical depression from the latch to like five minutes after the child is done. It's the most intense and crazy feeling I've ever felt. It's like sitting there and being happy and looking at your baby and then he starts sucking in your breast and your milk, um, you, you know, you get the letdown of the milk. And then I literally melt into wanting to die. Um, that is how emotionally awful breastfeeding was for me. And I stuck it out for six months. I stuck it out. And I, I will admit, bottle feeding is so much easier. Um, but yeah, it was a big struggle for me. So I don't judge women too harshly. But if you can, stick it out. It's definitely low time preference. It's definitely hard for a lot of people. I'm sorry about the dog. Uh, <laughs> but pray for me okay pray for me that my second child with my second child i will not have that condition and that i will not get mastitis and that the experience will be more pleasant for me please pray for me because i am actually that is the one thing i'm terrified of right now um i guess to finish off i hope you found some takeaways in this video and i hope you're not feeling judged or insulted if you already have kids i've admitted to my mistakes it's okay to try and do better and i can't directly judge you i don't know you maybe you have the most difficult child ever and in that case nothing sometimes nothing works okay um i'll end it by talking about napkin kids a napkin kid is a child that goes along to get along, very easygoing child. It's it's a term I thought of when I compared my sister and I as kids. I never tantrum. My mom didn't know what a tantrum was. She'd go she'd look at p kids tantruming and judge the parents and be like, "What is wrong with that kid? Right? What are they doing?" Because I was so easy. I was such an easy kid. My sister was born and my mom felt very bad for judging other parents after that because my sister was absolutely insane so definitely different children have different te temperaments some things are gonna be just so difficult and some kids are just not ready for it at certain ages but I'm trying to lay down basic principles basic guidelines um, based on high time preference and low time preference and give them a try see if they stick and you won't know until you do that, right? Don't just give up immediately. Uh, a lot of things with children are about consistency and perseverance. Anyways, that dog is so annoying. <laughs> I'm gonna go. And um, yeah, please uh, pray for a good birth for me and good breastfeeding experience. And I wish you the best as well.